whatever good things we build end up building us. In the summer of 1864, during one of the most difficult times in American history, another battle was being fought, this one for workers' rights. Piecing the country back together would prove to be a difficult task as men returned home and the process of rebuilding began. USA and Canada were built on the backs of hardworking men. Our history isn't just about the history of plaster and cement, it's the story of the building of nations. The OPCMIA emerged from humble beginnings. Its goals were simple, a livable wage, family health care benefits, and a pension for its workforce allowing them to retire with dignity and respect. They strive to organize the unorganized and provide the industry with the safest and best trained workforce in the world. Through tireless effort and measured progress, the OPCMIA has built its legacy. This wasn't an easy or direct path to the organization we see today. The Operative Plasterers and Cement Masons International Association is the result of centuries of effort on the part of working men and women to protect and promote the interests of both crafts through their steadfast, unified action. The journey to where we are today is a story of hardship, hard work, and steadfast men who stood up for what they knew to be right. It's a story of craftsmanship, prosperity, and responsibility. Today, we are these things because they were. Though founded in 1864, to fully understand the two crafts, we have to go back much further. From the Native American adobe huts of the American Southwest, to the pyramids of Egypt, where plaster work was performed at least 4,000 years ago, these structures serve as proof that when man first built, they plastered. It is seen time and again what an important role this played in the shaping of craftsmen through the ages, as well as the projects they worked on. The use of plaster as a fireproof material was recognized early. On June 11, 1212, a terrible fire raged across London, destroying countless houses and shops, as well as the London Bridge. Ordinance issued by King John of England was a turning point for the plastering trade. All shops in the Thames shall be whitewashed and plastered within and without. All houses which till now are covered with reed or rush, which can be plastered, let them be plastered within eight days, and let those which shall not be plastered be demolished by the aldermen and lawful men of the venues. Centuries later, King Henry VII of England, by his charter dated March 10, 1501, incorporated the worshipful company of plasterers. Let brotherly love continue, their motto stated. The charter empowered the governing body of the guild to supervise the trade, to search for bad workmanship, and to punish those guilty of it. The challenges of the OPCMIA today remain the same. The rules and regulations created by the learned workmen of the old world were instilled into the minds of the plasterers of the time and brought to North America in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. These intrepid men brought with them a desire to continue the traditions of their guilds and associations, which gradually resulted in the formation of the OPCMIA as we know it today. Those who emigrated from Europe formed independent local unions that would accept as members only those who migrated from a specific country. At the dawn of the 1800s, the chief function of the American locals was to ensure quality craftsmanship each local sought to guarantee that the plasterers in its jurisdiction were properly trained and that they had upheld the standards and pride of their craft throughout their careers. As the Industrial Revolution surged, concern amongst workers and their local organizations peaked as well. A number of technical and economic changes were taking place, 
many of which applied unfavorably to craftsmen both unorganized and organized. Further complicating the matter, the American Civil War had just entered its fourth year of bloody battle, putting a strain on the resources of both family and enterprise. A small group of men gathered in New York City, knowing there was never going to be a perfect time to take action on behalf of their trade. And so, on the hot summer day of July 21st, 1864, the Operative Plasterers National Union was born. The advent of railroads and steamships enabled building trade employees to seek and obtain contracts far from their normal base of operations. This new opportunity also brought with it fresh challenges. It was becoming common for a plasterer who belonged to one local to accept work in another area. This usually resulted in the worker being required to pay dues to two locals, his home union and the local, which had jurisdiction over his temporary workplace. On other occasions, apprentices would run away from their training programs before completion and would present themselves to employers or other locals as full-fledged journeymen, ignoring the local wage scales, undermining the quality of the craft, and weakening the locals. Although the union was a welcome addition to most tradesmen's lives, the initial transition to working through its structured government often caused disagreements between workers. The fledgling organization had to impress upon its members that the union belonged to all of them, and that by working together, positive change could and would come to be. The union strove to empower its members, recognizing that the members are the union, and in them lies the union's strength and power. An office report from an early convention read, that if not already convinced, the fact should be impressed upon the mind of every working man that in thorough and efficient organization and concerted action lies the salvation of the working classes. Legislation may aid to a limited extent, but in the strong arms of the workers can be found the remedy for most of their grievances. And banded together in the common cause, taking for their motto the old saying, heaven helps those who help themselves. By the mid-1880s, the Union had grown larger, stronger, and more influential on the political landscape. The organization became a pioneer in advocating for the formation of a Department of Labor, 30 years before that battle would finally be won. It was because of this growing reputation that in 1884, a letter was received from a Canadian local in Toronto, expressing their desire to join the Union. At that time, membership was limited to the United States, and modifying the Constitution to allow their admission was now being discussed. In 1887, the name of the organization was changed to the Operative Plasterers International Association of the United States and Canada, permitting affiliation of local unions from Canada. As the turn of the century approached, the union was experiencing significant growth and challenges, with discrepancies between acceptable conditions and pay by region becoming problematic. Some members worked 10-hour days, some eight. Some were paid $4 per day, while others only received $1.50. Knowing the organization's strength lie in its numbers and proven quality of labor, the first effort to bring cement work into the union was successfully implemented at the 16th convention held in Washington, D.C. in 1900. As the organization grew, so did the need to communicate with the members concerning issues related to their livelihood. And in January 1907, the first official OPC MIA journal was printed. It became a forum where members could get the most up-to-date information on the trade and discuss industry concerns. Among those concerns was quality. In an effort to control the quality of plastering work being done, and to prevent unqualified workers from doing plaster jobs that were not on par with the standards of the union members, the international union and locals sought city ordinances that directed how plaster was to be applied, simultaneously creating the position of plasterer inspector that would ensure the work was being done by competent craftsmen. The OPIA fortified these efforts by promoting quality plastering work and ornamental plastering in homes, churches, theaters, office buildings, colleges, clubs, and train depots. In 1914, the title of the organization was changed to the Operative Plasterers and Cement Finishers International Association of the United States and Canada. On July 19, 1915, an agreement was reached with the United Brotherhood of Cement Workers, which provided that the cement finishers of that organization would be admitted to the OPCFIA. 
After the integration of cement workers, the growing organization decided it was time to focus on safety. Beginning around 1914 and continuing for a number of years, the OPCMIA advertised the safety features of using metal lath and plaster. This came to the forefront of both countries' zeitgeist when a number of large fires engulfed buildings in New York City, Boston, and Chicago. Pictures of those fires made headlines, displaying to the public rooms, walls, and elevator shafts that had withstood the intense heat and severe strain of the inferno, unlike other substandard building materials. The union was showing its members produce buildings that last. Along with safety, member health was, and still is, a major concern of the international. A 1914 resolution introduced at the 23rd convention was an important step towards improved health for union members. No member shall be allowed to work over open salamanders, gasoline, oil torches, or any torch that is injurious to the health of our members. Prior to the adoption of this law, it was very common for members to be carried off on stretchers after inhaling poisonous fumes from coke-fired torches. Through continuous measured improvements in working conditions, the union became a standard bearer for workers' health rights and a model for other unions to follow. Ever since, the OPCMIA has continued to make training members on safety a top priority, holding a variety of classes and seminars to keep them healthy on the job, out of concern for both them and their families. This concern with member home life was a natural result of its growth. In the 1920s and 30s, the journal reported an increasing number of local union social events involving families. Picnics with ball games, races, and food drew large crowds of members bringing along spouses, children, and relatives. The union provided more than just a job. It became a social vehicle and opportunity for families to congregate for fun and relaxation. In the era of uncaring, bottom-line capitalists like Rockefeller and Carnegie, this community of caring brothers strengthened the bedrock of the still-growing union. The OPCFIA was dedicated to securing an eight-hour day, giving members the opportunity to cultivate a home life and spend time with the family. They vehemently fought for legislation against child labor, all the while improving their own training and safety standards to improve the lives of their members. Through the organization, the workers could see a little bit of their own humanity. The chief difference between organized industry and organized labor lies in the fact that organized industry places property rights above human rights. In the summer of 1914, war spread throughout Europe. The far-reaching implications set in motion that fateful summer created three of the most challenging decades in world history and the Union's place within it. It will never be argued that the organization didn't do its part. During the First Great War, the OPCFIA locals continued a tradition started during the Spanish-American War by maintaining the good standing of any tradesman in military service. The men who volunteer for service to their country under such trying conditions as exist today are deserving of the greatest consideration and highest honor that can be given them. That time-honored tradition still stands today and has been applied to every member who has served their country in conflict. With all efforts going towards the war, building products were hard to come by but the OPCFIA would not let that stand in the way of securing work for its members. The union worked with government officials to ensure that cement finishes be applied to buildings being erected for war purposes. Other government buildings, such as mess halls, aligned with plaster for both interior and exterior finishes. Whatever the war effort required, the OPCFIA stepped up to the plate. The Treaty of Versailles was signed into effect on June 28, 1919 and with victory secured, the boys were coming back home. In this transitional period, unions were encouraged to be faithful to veterans in their time of need. Today, the OPCMIA participates in the Helmet to Hard Hats program, a program to help military personnel returning from service transition back into civilian life with training in the trades of cement mason, plasterer, or shop hand. The camaraderie the OPCMIA embodies can best be summed up in the words written in a 1917 journal article. Now that many are to lay aside the tools of the trade to bear arms for the nation, let us grasp them by the hand in the bond of fellowship that binds us together and wish them Godspeed and a safe return to their homes and loved ones. 
While all members who serve deserve gratitude, one member, William H. Dean, was singled out for special honors. Brother Dean was a member of the 7th United States Cavalry, stationed at Havana, Cuba in 1898. He was the first from the ranks to offer himself as a martyr in the research of yellow fever transmission. Known only as Private XY in the study, Dean passed away on May 3, 1928. His eulogy was closed with the remarks, Comrade Dean, we honor your memory today. You live to serve and you serve that others might live. Today, the Dean Memorial Bridge at Grand Rapids is named in his honor. The years following the war were a time of transition. The post-war prosperity of the Roaring Twenties brought with it a feeling that anything was possible. The members used this progressive era to hone their craft, while the organization refocused on moving the industry forward. While city ordinances that directed how plaster was applied were being passed in many large jurisdictions during this time, there were still no established national standards for plastering. Local 8 member James Miles, who was a member of the American Society for Testing Materials, worked with the OPCFIA's blessing to establish the National Plastering Code. The morning of June 27, 1934, saw the signing of this code into law by the President of the United States, then Franklin Delano Roosevelt. At this time, the international organization was one of only two trades able to negotiate a minimum wage into their code. The long-promised and long-awaited code has finally become a reality. After years of hard work and struggle, the organization made good on its promise. The respite of the 1920s was short-lived, as a new unexpected crisis exploded in late October. On October 24, 1929, the stock market lost 11% of its value in a single day. Inexorably linked, this was a hammer blow for both American and Canadian tradesmen, as projects grinded to a halt. Fortunately for our American forebears, President Roosevelt took swift action. The Public Works Administration was part of Roosevelt's New Deal that began in 1933 with the aim to revolutionize the infrastructure of the United States and alleviate the strain of a depressed economy. Our Canadian membership was not quite so lucky. Policies modeled after the New Deal faltered in Canada as federal finance burdens hindered serious action. While American unemployment climbed to just over 20%, Canadians faced 27% unemployment and a 40% contraction in gross national product. In the U.S., projects like the Hoover Dam and the Empire State Building were beacons of hope for thousands of tradesmen simply wanting an honest day's work. The Hoover Dam was a union construction project, and OPCFIA members were employed, pouring its 4.4 million yards of concrete. The value of concrete as a pathway for motor vehicles had seen a rapid increase in popularity during the 1920s, and by the end of 1926, there was over 69,000 miles of concrete paved roads. This trend continued into the 1930s as automobile ownership and travel increased, providing many jobs for OPCFIA members. Along with automobile travel, aviation passenger service began. Although the ramifications of air travel were still not fully realized, the people of America and Canada were ready to welcome the speed, luxury, and cleanliness of aerial passenger transport. Slowly but surely, airport facilities were approved and built, creating further employment for OPCFIA members. The 1930s were not an era of prosperity for our organization. They did, however, prove our ability to face adversity and build our reputation of excellence. This would never be more important as both countries emerged from the Depression, only to be confronted with their biggest challenge yet. In September 1939, the greatest conflict the world has ever known drew Canada into its depths following Germany's invasion of Poland. The United States would join two years later following the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Once again, our organization came together to support the war effort and our brothers fighting overseas. Back home, the Union worked building much-needed housing and war infrastructure while adopting the use of machines into the cement finishing industry to speed the construction process along. Working with the Public Federal Housing Authority, the OPCFIA was able to procure specifications for temporary housing using lath and plaster in May of 1943. They also agreed that many roads needed rebuilding or improved from single to dual lane. 
New bridges needed to be built, old bridges strengthened, and bypasses needed to be constructed to divert traffic around towns, cities, and other congested areas. This vision of a future road network would become the arterial underpinning of travel during and after the war. However, ensuring the quality of construction housing and transportation networks would prove difficult. With so many skilled tradesmen serving overseas, the Union struggled to maintain its rigorous standards. By the time the war ended in 1945, the world and our organization breathed a collective sigh of relief. The OPCFIA prided itself on its continued tradition of helping our returning soldiers. Many young men were taken into apprentice classes, became members, and would go on to lead the organization into the future. The 1950s were good for the OPCFIA. Construction activity in 1957 broke the dollar volume record for the 12th straight year, reaching a grand total of 65 billion. Shopping centers, business centers, religious construction, private residential construction, state and local public works projects, highway and road constructions, education facilities, and sewer and water facilities aided this record-breaking year. The infrastructure programs that began in earnest in the 1930s continued, and much of the increased work came in the form of road building. By 1943, the vision of a road system utilizing overpasses and ramps to eliminate intersections was becoming a reality. By December of 1950, there was $1.7 billion spent on adding and improving over 60,000 miles of roads in the North American network. All the while, the organization continued to grow. In order to reflect the increasing jurisdiction and work of the cement finishers, the name was changed to the one we use today the Operative Plasterers and Cement Masons International Association. While television was beginning to find its way into more homes, radio was still the predominant force. Radio station WCFM in Washington, D.C. regularly featured the OPCMIA in its series on labor unions. The members from the D.C. area spoke about the union, its work, and the importance of plaster and cement in the building industry. Countless projects carried the Union through the 1950s. The Union in turn made further strides for its members, even beyond their working years. In 1954, Local 780 in New York City handed out their first pension checks to members. It was the first time pension checks were paid to the Cement Mason members of the OPCMIA out of a joint employer and Union Pension Trust Fund. The 1960s once again projected record-breaking spending in the construction industry. Across North America, though, there was a deeper problem, as many struggled for basic civil rights. This decade saw the passage of the Civil Rights Act, banning discrimination in jobs, voting, and accommodations. It is interesting to note that while this bill was signed into law by President Johnson in August 1965, our union, in an article in the May 1909 journal, urged all locals to set nationality and religion aside and welcome all people in the craft. Our cornerstone rests upon a foundation on which is inscribed for the uplifting of mankind, not of any particular nationality or religious belief, but of all. And in return, all that we expect is that a man will be upright and honorable in his dealing with his fellow men. Let us all work upon that broad policy of the uplifting of all mankind. Let us use every effort to bring about a general feeling of brotherly love and forever cast aside this sectionalism. The OPCMIA fought for what was right, promoting equality over half a century before the Civil Rights Act was signed into law. Amidst this, the OPCMIA reached a historic milestone, a 100th anniversary. President Lyndon B. Johnson addressed the 40th convention by telephone from his Texas ranch. The right of the working man to be recognized and to bargain collectively must not and will not be compromised as long as I sit in the White House. Our challenge is not to turn back or to look aside, but to go ahead to the work that will make this a better and finer land for all of us. That struggle for a better and finer land still continues. Since the 1960s, the OPCMIA has sponsored a contract with the federal government to offer pre-apprenticeship training to America's disadvantaged youth through the Job Corps program. Today, the OPCMIA operates about 50 vocational training programs in either plastering or cement masonry, 
and trains over 1,200 young men and women each year in the basics of our trade. Many of these young men and women have gone on to become strong union leaders in the OPCMIA. Leaders like the Job Corps students who helped rebuild homes in Lafayette, Louisiana for the victims of Hurricane Katrina. With the new decade of the 70s came new challenges. The big challenge that faces the international union and the local unions that comprise it is the challenge of keeping abreast with the almost unceasing flow of new materials and products into the construction field. And at the same time, keeping a watchful and promotional eye on the materials that generations of our crafts have worked with. Member pensions remained an essential part of the union. The OPCMIA encouraged local unions to adopt a reciprocity agreement that would protect a member's coverage in his pension fund, whether he is employed at home or somewhere else. 1977 saw the first state apprenticeship competition held by any OPCMIA local at the California State Conference in San Francisco. To this day, plaster and cement mason apprentices from the United States and Canada display their talents at apprentice competitions like these. The 1980s once again saw battle over the prevailing wage laws that were under attack in Congress and state legislatures around the country and by anti-labor groups seeking to repeal the law. These same groups were also right to work and created other anti-union labor efforts. Unions were now under attack. When President Reagan fired the air traffic controllers, management rejoiced and began their campaign to break the unions. In these negotiations, concession demands were the rule. The OPCMIA stood firm, stating, If concessions will bring more jobs, then we'll talk about them. But if concessions only stimulate more profit for the employer, then we are against such concessions. Despite the attacks, the OPCMIA stood strong and remained dedicated to the needs of the country. The energy crisis of the late 70s was still being felt, and the need for saving energy and dollars was on everyone's minds. In the days of energy shortages and high prices, the OPCMIA assisted in efficiency projects like exterior wall insulation to meet the energy crisis. These green initiatives have continued and are of the utmost importance to our organization today. The past 30 years have seen significant strides in the realm of safety and health. A new safety and health training program was established and the OPCMIA began a program to offer its members benefits that extended to families including supplemental Medicare benefits, credit card programs, home buying services, auto insurance, and many other benefits that are still easily available to OPCMIA members today. Through the 1980s, the union was battling on many fronts, right to work, pension and retirement, immigrations and anti-union sentiment. The officers of the OPCMIA coped with these issues on a daily basis, even though success was not guaranteed. A major step was taken for women in the 1981 California State Conference. The apprentice competition held at the conference saw the first women participant to compete in an organizational competition. The first international apprenticeship competition was held three years later in conjunction with the 45th OPCMIA convention in Las Vegas. 13 plasterers and 24 cement masons competed in the contest. With the decline in birth rate and the American population getting older, the union looked to its future membership needs. The 1990s saw an organizing department and the position of organizing director established at international headquarters. As OPCMIA moved into the 21st century, organizing and training continued to be the lifeblood of the OPCMIA, even in one of the toughest economic times since the Great Depression. The organization learned through the years that crises come and go, but the strength always lie in the members. In the new millennium, the International continues to offer benefits to its members and families. In 2009, the union began the OPCMIA Scholarship Foundation to provide continuing education opportunities for the sons and daughters of the OPCMIA members. New environmental challenges bring with them new green technologies and processes that improve our two countries' long-term infrastructure. We're creating new energy-efficient buildings significantly improving existing building operations and reducing our carbon footprint. The OPCMIA is an organization with a storied past and with initiatives like these is looking towards a brighter future. While we all have pride in our history, 
we also share an obligation to the founders of our crafts. The words and sentiment expressed in the article looking forward to the 100th anniversary in 1964 still hold true for us today as we observe our 150th and commemorate other milestones. We who are presently deriving our living from and planning our futures upon the success of our crafts in maintaining and expanding the use of material and methods familiar to and generally associated with our crafts should pause in our fast-moving modern life long enough to examine ourselves and in fairness judge ourselves as to whether or not we are faithfully applying the lessons of the past adequately maintaining the fundamentals of our crafts and honestly evaluating the present and future needs of our crafts we are called upon to remember with respect the trials endured by the founders of our crafts and to honor their memory by passing along to your sons and daughters the unsullied fundamentals handed to you by the founders. We ask you to use your skills in instilling into your employer and fellow workmen that pride and achievement that enables workmen to transfer into reality the dreams of the architects. And that leads our fellow citizens to have confidence in the safety, endurance, and beauty of the structures we erect. It is said that by your works you shall be known, and we trust that you and all engaged in our craft shall be known throughout eternity for their works and efforts on behalf of their fellow men. The OPCMIA has a rich and proud history. Over the decades, the skill and dedicated work of the members of the OPCMIA have touched the lives of many. We have built homes and hospitals. We have constructed roads and runways. We have built dams and driveways. We have constructed and beautified state capitals and stadiums and have preserved theaters and symphony halls. We have built monuments and military bases. We have renovated the White House and provided homes. We have constructed places of worship and places to care for those with special needs. We have donated our time and talent to communities and groups and individuals in need of assistance. Each one of us can be proud of our heritage and inspired by those on whose shoulders we stand. We remember and pay tribute to all of those members who came before us. They have handed down their knowledge and skills to younger generations. Many showed strength and determination in difficult times, fighting for dignity, fair wages, and safety in the workplace, for shorter work days and a better quality of life for their families. They have left us a legacy. We are, at the same time, living the legacy left to us and creating the legacy for future OPC MIA generations. We declare today and hope that future plasterer, cement mason, and shop hand members will look back on us with the same respect that we view our past and seeing the legacy of strength and determination will proudly declare, we are trained because they were trained. We are skilled because they were skilled. We are proud and determined because they were proud and determined. We are family because they were family. We are because they were.